Welcome to the Fall Campus Conversation hosted by the University Libraries. This series began in 2015 with the aim of fostering an exchange of ideas and perspectives as faculty members shared their research interests and expertise and invited conversation on their ideas. We have had faculty members who have served as conversation starters from a wide range of departments. While we would love to have our conversation in person, we are delighted to be able to start offering new talks this fall after hosting updates on previous talks last year. As this will be the last campus conversation I will introduce, I would like particularly to thank the university libraries administrators for their support that enabled us to turn this idea I was passionate about into a reality. I'd also like to thank the committee members who have worked so hard, Irina Holden, Mark Wolf, Camille Chesley, Jane Kessler, and Tyler Norton, who is stepping into the position of committee chair. I'd also like to thank all of those who have graciously and enthusiastically agreed to share their work and all who have attended, a number of you on a very regular basis. I would now like to welcome Dr. Michael Sattinger, Professor of Economics. Dr. Sattinger received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon and his most recent books are Qualitative Mismatches and Into the Gap, Exploring Gaps and Mismatches. He has recently engaged in research that shows how optimal income taxation can be determined using double limit analysis and how it affects inequality in after-tax income. His presentation today is Costs of Higher Education and Inequality. Thank you, Michael, for being willing to talk with us today about this extremely important topic. Thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank the University Libraries for inviting me to present this, this work. And uh, I'm going to start out by uh, posing the questions I'm going to address today. Uh, these are all very important questions, and what I'm going to try to do today is to link them uh, together to show how these questions are related. Uh, and also, I want to emphasize that these aren't the only connections between costs of higher education, education itself, uh, college wage premiums, and inequality. There are other links and mechanisms by which inequality can be affected. But these are the uh, basic questions I'll be uh, addressing today. Let me start with the motivation for this research. This came about incidentally to uh, some research I was doing on worker job mismatches. And there was a lot of data available on the, the circumstances causing mismatches. And some of the data was from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. They had a project to try to estimate the rates of return to a college education, both the public rates of return and the private direct, the private rates of return. Uh, and part of that research involved comparing, uh, this is uh, comparisons across country, and part of that research uh, calculated the costs of producing higher education. And I was uh, astounded to see in the figures for 2007 that the costs of higher education in the United States were twice as high as the next highest uh, more or most expensive countries, which were Canada and Japan at that time. So that was motivation. And I thought, well, obviously this has to have tremendous consequences. Uh, not only for the operation of our educational system, but for uh, the labor market and the economy in general. Uh, and uh, that resulted in my looking at uh, or taking a different view towards questions that were uh, very current. Uh, let me start out with the costs to the, uh, to the students themselves. This is information from the college board. It's showing the real, how the uh, real costs of uh, tuition and fees have changed from 1990 to the present time. And you can see that the, the greatest increases were for public four-year uh, institutions, which would, of course, include the University at Albany. Um, and uh, 
what this doesn't show is what's been happening to costs of production. This is just the costs to uh, students, our clients, as we might refer to them. Uh, so let me uh, move on to uh, net tuition revenues. This is other evidence on costs. And this also shows increases in the real costs of uh, producing higher education. This is broken down into two parts, the uh, net tuition revenues and the level of the subsidy. Uh, the point here is that the subsidy is calculated as a difference between the cost, which is calculated separately, and the net tuition revenues. And you can see both for a public and private nonprofit that uh, the costs went up between 2000, the academic year 2007-2008 and uh, 10 years later with a dip in between uh, reflecting uh, apparently a decline uh, in those subsidies. Um, let me move, this is uh, more or less background on this. Uh, this is a cross-country comparison of those costs. This is also from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and they compare the costs using purchasing power parity, which is a, a fairly complicated method of comparing purchasing power of uh, 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 currencies in, uh, in different countries. So this is intended to make comparable the real costs across different countries. So you can see if you disregard uh, research and development that the United States is still the most expensive, uh, is still the highest cost country in terms of producing higher education. Uh, and this might even be higher if we consider that the number of years it takes to get a bachelor's degree in the United States uh, may be greater than the number of years in other, in other countries there. And you can see the OECD average down here and the European average there. So um, this raises the questions, why have costs gone up over time? And there are lots of answers to this. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, there are just lots of books and articles on college costs and what's been happening to college costs. Uh, this was a book by uh, Archibald and Feldman. They did uh, a lot of research on uh, college costs. Ronald Ehrenberg also studied the question, and there have been also books by uh, William Bowen. Uh, the basic argument comes from uh, an article written by William Baumel and William Bowen in 1965. They were studying the economic difficulties of nonprofit organizations such as orchestras because their costs kept going up. Uh, and the, the basic reason uh, is also a point that applies to uh, colleges and universities or all higher education, namely they're in the services. What happens in manufacturing is that we get regular increases in productivity in manufacturing, which is then reflected in higher wage rates in manufacturing. So uh, with those generally higher wage rates across the country, the cost of providing services uh, uh, increases, even though productivity hasn't increased in the provision of those services. So that's a basic reason why costs have increased over time. There are other points also brought about by Archibald and Feldman. Uh, technological change favors workers with more education. Uh, so their wages increase relative to less educated workers. And that applies in particular for faculty working at uh, uh, institutions of, uh, higher, of higher education. Uh, and the third point is what we have to teach changes over time, technological changes technological advances uh, raise educational costs because the needs of college students have increased. We have to offer uh, different uh, topics such as Homeland Security uh, to cite a local example. Um, so those are reasons why costs would increase over time. Uh, and there's an alternative approach because of incentives. 
This takes a very different view of the reason for cost increases. Better is arguing basically that uh, why can't a college be more like a firm? He says, well, if these you know, competitive pressures operated, then uh, colleges would be able to increase their productivity uh, in the same way that, that, for example, manufacturing firms might be able to do. But, but the problem is these answers do not explain why costs are higher in the United States than in other countries. These same explanations might apply in other countries. So uh, with that uh, question in mind, uh, the next step I want to do is to look at the link between college costs and college wage premiums and inequality. So let me move on here. This is uh, a uh, diagram that was prepared by Golden and Katz. Uh, and I'll get in, into what they did a little bit uh, later. But this shows what's been happening to the college wage premium. And this is not a simple diagram to, uh, to produce. They're not just plotting points that they're reading in some, uh, in some uh, government uh, publication. They had to construct this information from uh, what, what we call wage bills. That is, what is the total income for college graduates? Uh, what is total income for high school graduates? And from there, get the relationship uh, between their, their wages or their incomes. So there is a lot of work going on behind this diagram. Uh, and this is very, has been a very influential diagram because it uh, tells a story that has been observed in terms of inequality, namely that over the 20th century, we've had very large declines in inequality over most of the 20th century. Uh, down to some time in the 1960s or 1970s. And then we've had increasing inequality since then. And the shape of these uh, diagrams of these uh, um, uh, lines here, these, these uh, uh, curves or connected dots, I should say, um, uh, reflect that uh, uh, major change in uh, college wage premiums in this country and the level of uh, inequality. So that uh, we can present that as uh, evidence as what's been happening to uh, the college wage premium. Uh, and there have been two basic explanations for the increase in the college wage premium over time. Uh, and these explanations have pretty much dominated the discussion and economics of the causes of the increases in the college wage premium. The first explanation is based on uh, technological change. Uh, uh, Darren Asimoglu argues that the reason lies in skill bias technological change. That is when we get technological change, it favors people with more education uh, compared to less education. So what happens because of this technological change, if we've had an acceleration, for example, in technological change is that it increases the demands for college educated individuals uh, relative to their supplies and relative to the demands for uh, high school graduates. So uh, uh, this, has, this is really a significant contribution to our understanding of how technological change might affect um, uh, what's going on. Also, uh, Asimoglu is essentially taking the demand approach. He's looking at the demand side for uh, college graduates and high school graduates. Uh, the problem with that approach is that um, uh, technology is quickly shared among developed countries, uh, but not all countries have experienced the the same increase in the college wage premium, which has been much greater in the United States than in most other countries. Uh, and there, there are simply different patterns in what takes place. Uh, some countries have not experienced uh, uh, an increase in the, in the college wage premium as, as indicated in the previous diagram. Uh, the other approach by Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz takes a supply side 
uh, they argue that technological change has in fact been steady uh, and if there's skill bias, well, that's been there for a long uh, time also. Uh, the real answer lies on the supply side and they wrote uh, a very uh, well-respected review of education in the United States going back to uh, revolutionary times. Uh, and they did a, a lot of economic history uh, in, in uh, their development. So they argue that the growth rate of uh, the number of college graduates and uh, education in general has slowed down in the United States. Uh, and that's the slowdown, which is responsible for the increasing college wage differential. Um, a, and they, they have, uh, their explanation is that US schools do not provide high quality education to less advantaged students. And there are other arguments uh, uh, there also uh, that are relevant. But basically, they don't explain why uh, uh, higher, the, the growth rates in higher education slowed down in the United States. And that's the point that I hope to link to the increasing college costs. So let me uh, move on with some information on enrollments. This is not a very good figure, uh, but it tells you where you can find the data on enrollments. It shows total uh, enrollments, college enrollment rates between four year and two year institutions and the total and it doesn't seem to fluctuate very much. You can barely make out uh, some, uh, you know, a period of increases from 2000 to maybe 2012, and then uh, decreases up to uh, 2018. But you really need a longer period of time to look at these questions. So here's some more uh, evidence. This is from uh, a publication of the College Board, and uh, this shows. Uh, post-secondary enrollment rates for all 18 to 24 year, old, year olds and it goes back to 1978 and you can see that there was a dip from 1978 to sometime in the 1980s followed by unequal increases by race and ethnicity. Another point that we can make about this diagram is that there are opportunities for increasing enrollments in the United States if we could bring uh, all race and ethnicity groups up to uh, the same uh, level of enrollments here. So there's some hope in, uh, in that diagram, okay? Um, here is the diagram uh, updated from the Golden and Katz uh, book, which was in, uh, I think, 2008. Um, so, this is looking at mean years of schooling at age 30 and how that has changed over time. And this, is, and this goes way back uh, to about 1875 or so. And again, this took a lot of uh, time to develop, uh, a lot of uh, research to uh, gather these figures and combine them for uh, periods, I think before 1930 or 40, they used information from the Iowa census to look at mean years of schooling or changes over time. They also used the Iowa census, which was very detailed uh, to construct their uh, college wage differential figures. So they, they combine those two sources of data and it looks like there is a significant and sharp change sometime uh, in the 1940s where this curve sort of flattens out and the growth rate slows down. Uh, this is um, slightly, mis I won't say slightly misleading, but they don't discuss the other things that are going on. Disruption to education during the Second World War, the GI Bill, Sputnik is in there somewhere. Uh, the Vietnam War is in there uh, influencing um, uh, the amount of education that, uh, that people get. Uh, the other clue to what is going on in this diagram is from another diagram 
that uh, Golden and Katz prepared in their book, which separates the uh, college enrollment rates by gender, and they show a really substantial decline in college enrollment rates going from the 1940s to the 1950s for males. Uh, previous to that time, female uh, enrollment rates had been lower than for males, uh, and female enrollment rates also flattened a little bit between the, uh, uh, the 1940s and 1950s, and then overtook the enrollment rates for males and are now consistently uh, above the enrollment rates for males. So that's, that's a phenomenon which uh, can partially explain this particular shape, that sudden drop, not sudden, but over a relatively short, shorter uh, period of time, maybe 10 years, in college enrollment rates for males. Um, so uh, let's ask how would that have taken place? How are college costs linked to the decline in enrollments as described by Golden and Katz and Auteur uh, in that recent article? Um, well, this is basically an argument uh, uh, related to the human capital argument uh, that the incentive to attend college is based both on the costs and the returns to college. But these can occur at, at uh, these can change at different points in time. Suppose we start out with an increase in the costs of higher education. That has the initial effect uh, of reducing the incentive to get a college education. And then with a reduced college incentive, the growth in college graduates slows down. Uh, and then the third step is lower growth rates and numbers of college graduates would start to raise college graduate wages relative to wages for the high school graduates. And eventually, at some point, the college graduate wages uh, rise enough so that the incentive to attend college goes back up. So this is consistent with the human capital um, argument that uh, enrollment, in which disregards other causes, by the way, that it, uh, the incentive to enroll in college depends on the costs and returns to uh, college. Um, so uh, that's my, my argument based on that uh, human capital reasoning. That leads to the question, okay, so we have this increase in the college wage premium. How much is that contributing to inequality? Uh, a lot of people, I think, took the college wage premium as itself a measure of inequality, but it's not, okay? Uh, and there is work that tries to decompose the increase in inequality over time. So this is from work by Hoffman, Lee, and Lemieux. Uh, decomposing inequality going from 1975 up through uh, the period of 2015 to 2018 into the, the various things that contribute to inequality. And the two big contributions here are the uh, amount in blue and the amount in red. The amount in blue is, uh, it comes from the differences in incomes within a particular educational level. Uh, in other words, you look at everybody who has a high school degree and not a college degree, and you ask how unequal are their uh, incomes or wages, okay? And then you, and you can see this contributes the most to inequality. And then uh, the question is, well, how much does the difference in incomes between college graduates and high school graduates contribute to inequality. And that's the amount in red, and that's been increasing over time also, okay? So uh, the point is that the college wage premium does not explain the increase within educational levels. So uh, the college wage premium does affect inequality, but it doesn't explain the total increase in inequality. 
And this yellow part for compensation, that refers to the compensation by uh, education and experience of, uh, of individuals. So it brings in the, the uh, experience there. Um, so now uh, I turn to the point, uh, why does uh, higher education cost more in the United States than in other countries? Uh, and Archibald and Feldman discuss a number of features of U.S. education that may increase our costs above costs in other countries if they don't have the same features, okay? And one is prestige games. That is, there's a lot of uh, what they describe as wasteful competition trying to get into the top 10. And no matter how hard colleges uh, try to get into the top 10, only 10 of them make it. There's a basic problem there. The second problem is gold plating. Uh, the idea that colleges are trying to provide amenities to attract students. Uh, and uh, these amenities cost more and more money, okay? Uh, increase the costs of, of the education. And, and colleges are essentially uh, forced to compete in terms of these amenities in order to attract uh, a sufficient number of uh, students enrolling. Uh, the faculty ratchet refers to uh, how faculty members can define their positions in ways that reduce their workloads. Uh, in other words, teach smaller classes, um, teaching less, uh, shifting work to professional staff and so on. Uh, there's the administrative lattice. Uh, they have all of these fancy names. The expansion of support for activities outside the classroom, such as academic advising and career services, information technology services, uh, and so on. Uh, these, I think, play an important role uh, in uh, United States education. I don't know how extensive uh, these support activities are, these uh, activities are in, uh, in other countries. Uh, and then Archibald and Feldman make a comparison between United States higher education and the dental industry, um, because that's also a service industry. Uh, and that comparison suggests that these explanations are less relevant to uh, increases in costs in the United States, okay? Um, so now I get into a level of conjecture about what uh, would be a robust explanation for uh, why costs are higher in the United States. And that rests on the differentiation among colleges and also the, uh, 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 the fact that our higher educational system is highly decentralized. Uh, states have their own systems of higher education. Localities have their own, some localities have their own uh, um, higher educational systems, which, which they support. Uh, and so we have great differentiation and uh, diversity in the types of college experience that students can get. So there's just many different ways in which a differentiation uh, uh, occurs. It, it, it's not limited to just locality, it's physical structure. You can just look at the University at Albany. Um, accommodation of different students, faculty, uh, size, uh, course offerings, majors, history, reputation, strengths. I made up this list here, requirements, culture, and amenities. So these are all ways in which uh, institutions of higher education differ. Uh, and a consequence of this differentiation is that an institution of higher education will not lose all its enrollments if it raises charges to students, nor will it gain substantial enrollments by lowering uh, their charges. I'm trying to keep track of time here. This, this uh, is analogous to what we describe in economics as monopolistic competition when we describe different uh, industrial structures. Uh, and in monopolistic competition, 
you have firms producing a differentiated product uh, and therefore they have sort of like a mini monopoly. They can raise their prices and not lose all their customers. If they lower them, they can't gain unlimited sales. So this is very different from a perfectly competitive situation. Also in monopolistic competition, there's free entry into the industry. We don't have that uh, when we're talking about uh, United States higher education. Uh, uh, we don't have free entry. It's not that easy to enter uh, with, uh, with, a, with a new institution, although, as you know, uh, people are trying now. Um, and uh, the point is that um, uh, generally, if you look at the finance of institutions of higher education, um, their financial situation improves when more students enroll, you know, hold, holding the quality of uh, students the same. Uh, and this suggests that if we had the same number of students, but distributed them among fewer uh, institutions, the, the costs of higher education would go down, okay? Uh, or their financial uh, situation would improve and they need fewer subsidies. Uh, so that raises the question, uh, if that's the case, if less differentiation and fewer institutions would reduce US costs, um, that would also uh, reduce the amount of differentiation among institutions and opportunities to students, including access by minorities and first generation students uh, and choices. So there's going to be a trade off there. And the basic question is whether that is worth the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the reduction in costs. And I'm putting that out there. I'm not answering that question. I'm just sort of posing that. And another question is what evidence is there uh, regarding this, this uh, conjecture? We could look at how the financial conditions of institutions vary uh, with their enrollments over time. Uh, this is some more evidence that shows the stability in the numbers of public and private nonprofit institutions over time. This doesn't also doesn't go back far enough. What happened uh, after Sputnik, for example? Sputnik put me through graduate school uh, and uh, led to a great expansion in our higher education system. So uh, I, I think I've used up my half hour. Uh, and this is the, the summary of conclusions here. I hope uh, that uh, not everybody agrees with uh, what I've been saying so we can have a, uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, and these are, of course, broad questions. Uh, there's much more evidence. There are many more routes connecting the, uh, higher education and uh, inequality uh, and many features of higher education which can reduce inequality also. And I've got references here if uh, people have uh, any questions. And at that point, I am going to turn it uh, over to, uh, uh, oh, we have a chat question here. Uh, does the higher cost of education in the US have an impact on dropout rates or retention by the more expensive colleges and universities uh, at, at, at the benefit of those that might cost less? And, I will leave that as an open question here. So I will turn it back to you. I can stop the share and always call it back. Uh, there we go. Yep. If you have questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. If you have comments or other conversations, that as well. I, I thought it was bizarre that uh, people are justifying the creation of a new college, the University of Austin. Uh, on the grounds that there is insufficient differentiation among U.S. institutions of, uh, of higher education, and that therefore we need one more. So does how do public universities play out in my explanation? Um, I I I haven't really looked at that question. I just looked at the total number of institutions. Obviously we have a great deal of variety. 
uh, and differentiation between public institutions and private institutions. Uh, certainly, no matter you know what takes place, private institutions are going to continue. They have uh, loyal alumni um, and are more or less forced to differentiate uh, in order to attract students that would otherwise go to public universities. Um, so, um, I I. I think to answer that question, you'd have to look at the finances of uh, private nonprofit institutions and see if there are vulnerable uh, institutions. Uh, one difference between colleges and firms, um, to go back to uh, Vetter's uh, complaint, is that we not only don't have free entry into US higher education, we don't have free exit. That is, it's not so easy to stop operating as an institution of higher education. Um, uh, they, they would find ways of struggling on if they're in financial difficulty. Just to address the first question, uh, uh, consequences of higher costs of education in the United States. Um, I think one of the difficulties of higher, edu of higher costs of education is that the higher costs generate more inequality among people who go to college or decide to uh, go to college. If they don't make it, if they drop out of college, they're not getting the benefit, but they still have those higher costs. And that can cause uh, difficulties or substantial difficulties associated with uh, student debt. I'm being asked to speculate on current events. Uh, the ongoing situation with but COVID would uh, play into this. Uh, there, there are huge numbers of, I think, um, uh, economic and other social studies of what's going on with COVID and how it's impacting everything. Uh, I, I think that there's going to be a blip in college graduation rates, obviously, uh, and the cohort that went ahead and got their degrees in spite of remote learning and remote teaching um, uh, are probably going to do fairly well uh, by you know, having made it through because they'll have a smaller cohort coming out into the uh, labor market. But I, I think there are a number of difficulties for institutions that, are, that were created by COVID uh, and will probably take some time to recover. And I don't know how uh, teaching and programs are going to change from COVID. That is uh, outside my area of expertise. Okay, so we have a question about um, two-year colleges suffering from lower enrollment numbers. I don't know about uh, what's happening between two-year institutions and four-year institutions. They've had different patterns of increase in costs over time, which should have favored two-year institutions. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a lot of, but that, you know, that's a good question. Uh, that'd be a good dis uh, dissertation for somebody. A quick question. Uh... Prior to the pandemic, there was a concern in higher education about uh, states dramatically reducing funding. I believe it was something from like 2007 to 2019, there was 15, 16% cuts in like real terms yes. for higher education funding. Yeah. Um, how much do you think that played a role in the rising costs, obviously, like it would. Yeah. Uh, significantly. If, if, if uh, you recall that slide showing what happened to tuitions, the tuitions uh, for um, uh, four year institutions, I think, went up much faster than for two year institutions. But the, the other situation is that uh, I think uh, state funding of higher education declined because, you know, states had substantial financial difficulties after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and that showed up a little bit also in, in that slide showing uh, net subsidy 
uh, that net subsidy went down because uh, 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 institutions uh, lost uh, that financial support from state and local governments. So that that certainly had a significant effect. It, it may have shifted the cost more to students and away from uh, uh, state and local uh, government. Have you noticed anything um, outside conventional market factors adjusting costs, whether it be like artificial inflation? I don't know. Uh, I, another consideration is the interest rates that students need to pay on their student loans, uh, on their student debt. Uh, that should have gone down after 2008. Uh, but, you know, I haven't looked at that question. I think the College Board has a lot of information on what's been happening with student debt uh, and maybe on the burden of debt on uh, uh, graduates. Uh, so that would certainly be relevant. I mean, that's a market factor, actually. Uh, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, what's been happening uh, in terms of the interest that high school graduates have in attending college. I, we don't have any high school graduates in our household, <laughs> recent high school graduates in our household are out there. They can uh, give uh, uh, an economic perspective also. What do you see as your next steps? What impact would you like to see your research have on policy, for example? Well, uh, I, yeah, that's a good question because uh, the, I, I think the most important thing is to establish the significance of higher U.S. college costs on the college wage premium. Uh, that recent paper by Auteur, Golden, and Katz simply reiterated uh, uh, the, the existing literature that the causes lie in the slowdown of uh, uh, in, in uh, United States education. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, it reiterates uh, Asimoglu's argument for the skill biased uh, technological change. So uh, those remain the, the dominant explanations for the increase in the college wage premium um, and not the higher costs of uh, education in the United States. I'm going to put a link in the chat because I knew I'd seen this before. My master's degree is in higher education. And this was a case study at George Washington University where their president artificially raised tuition by some like exorbitant amount, I think it grew to over $20,000 in increased cost because a higher tuition rate improved their USA news yes. ranking. <laughs> it made them seem more prestigious and then more students applied because they had a higher ranking. Uh, this, this is, yes. yeah, this is, this is a phenomenon of judging quality by price. You know, uh, do you want to go to a cheap brain surgeon or an expensive brain surgeon? Assuming you need brain surgery, uh, the answer is you want to go to the expensive one. Uh, this, I mean, this appears all kinds of different places, uh, but I haven't seen it in higher education. There should be uh, more objective criteria that uh, uh, prospective students would be able to look at. I wonder if that would be a good strategy for the University of Austin. <laughs> yes, to charge. <laughs> Near six figures in tuition. Well, I, I, uh, I, I observed the comparisons over time in, in our family. Uh, I, 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 just a little autobiographical information. My father went to the University of Michigan in the Depression, and the out-of-state tuition was $25 a year. <laughs> and they couldn't afford it, of course. Uh, I paid something like $250 uh, in-state tuition. Uh, and then our son went there, 
uh, uh, and he paid, I think it started at around $16,000 per year and it went up to $18,000 per year. So <laughs> just orders of magnitude different between, uh, between generations. Oh, there's the link. This is in the uh, Atlantic. Uh, uh, Meet the high priest of runaway college inflation. He regrets nothing. <laughs> Let me send it to everybody too. There we go. Now everybody can. Okay. Can find that link. And while they're while they're uh, uh, clicking that, I might mention I give a special thanks to university libraries because uh, my mother uh, was a librarian. I've mentioned this before. Uh, she was paid a miserable salary with a master's degree in public health because of ob obviously the, the absence of pandemics <laughs> when she graduated. Uh, and uh, uh, so she thought, oh, library science, that's a high paying profession. So she made a mid-career change at a master's in uh, library science and then worked first for the American Mathematical Association uh, and then Eastern Michigan University as a librarian. So I especially appreciate uh, uh, the support of librarians here. Thank you for the, the support. We have our, um, our economics and business librarian is on this call too. Good. Any closing thoughts, Trudy? I don't think so, but thank you so much. Eye opening. Um, and I also would like to thank you for your uh, support of the libraries and librarians. Oh, you're welcome. You deserve it. Yeah, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to send them. If not, we thank you for joining us. We will be sharing this on our YouTube account as well as on the library's website. Thank you all. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming and commenting. <laughs>